Today, we're going to tell you about some really big changes, how we're going to take the Mac to a whole new level. He's not wrong. So today was Apple's yearly Worldwide Developers Conference, aka WWDC, the first of its kind in this social distancing era, and I gotta say, Apple kinda nailed it. The production level was insane. For real though, I hope Apple continues to take this path moving forward because it was the best keynote in a really long time. Definitely did not miss any of this. Ho ho ho, let's uh, go to back up here and get right in. We got a look at iOS 14, which packs widgets, cue the Android comments, app libraries, and huge improvements to messages, specifically group messages. We also saw updates to iPadOS, tvOS, watchOS, that hand-washing timer deserves a golf clap, and the debut of macOS 11, AKA Big Sur. So all that was great and cool and awesome and fantastic, but by far the biggest moment today was the announcement of the transition to custom Apple ARM-based Macs. Oh my God, it is happening. The Mac has had three major transitions in its history. The move to PowerPC, the transition to Mac OS X, and the move to Intel. And now it's time for a huge leap forward for the Mac. Because today is the day we're announcing that the Mac is transitioning to our own Apple Silicon. We've heard rumors of ARM-based Macs for years now that Apple was gonna ditch Intel. And I think deep down in our hearts, we knew it was coming, but I don't think anybody knew that it was coming this fast. And for the customers, we expect to ship our first Mac with Apple Silicon by the end of this year, and we expect the transition to take about two years. Two years, that is crazy. Now, if you just bought a Mac, stay calm, don't freak out. It doesn't mean that your new computer is instantly worthless. Apple will continue to support Intel-based Macs and even announced that we're gonna see new ones this year. We plan to continue to support and release new versions of Mac OS for Intel-based Macs for years to come. In fact, we have some new Intel-based Macs in the pipeline that we're really excited about. Again, this is a transition. It's gonna take time and it's also a safe bet that first Apple-powered Mac isn't gonna outpower a Mac Pro or a high-end iMac or even a 16-inch MacBook Pro. Before I dive in a little deeper, by now you've probably heard the term SOC being thrown around. That stands for System on a Chip and that's what Apple is referring to when they're talking about their custom silicon. If you look at something like a traditional desktop computer, you have multiple components, the processor, memory, graphics card, and those are all housed separately on something like a motherboard. With an SOC, those components are much, much, much smaller and all live on a single piece of silicon. For Apple, this is a culmination of 10 years of making custom chips that dates all the way back to the original iPhone, then to the iPad, and surprisingly, even the Apple Watch. With the iPhone, it was the first of its kind. For Apple to get that kind of power in something that small, the key was performance per watt. The chips got faster, actually over 100 times faster throughout the years, but equally important, power efficiency continued to improve as well. So with the iPhone, Apple was forced to improve and refine their silicone in a relatively small footprint, but with the iPad, they had room to push that even further. That's really where the huge leaps came in terms of graphics performance, and you combine that with the CPU advancements, and that's why the iPad Pro is currently faster than some MacBooks right now. Now, if you're wearing an Apple Watch, there's a good chance you probably don't ever really think about how or why it works the way it does. It just does. But what's actually going on is Apple's years of silicone advancements, but on a much smaller scale with even lower power requirements. So typically how it works is more performance equals more power consumption, right? So with desktops, that's where you're traditionally getting the absolute most performance, but they also suck a lot of power. With laptops, you're trading power for portability with lower power consumption. So the goal of these new Apple-based Macs is the highest amount of performance with the lowest amount of power consumption. And that's why the iPad Pro can export 4K video without a fan, whisper silent, and your MacBook sounds like 17 leaf blowers strapped to a Vitamix. So those chips are going to continue to get faster. The power efficiency is going to keep getting better and that's exciting, but there's actually a couple more benefits with these custom Apple chips. First off, it's not limited to just raw CPU and GPU performance. It's all those little things that go on behind the scenes. The neural engine, machine learning, power management, which leads to better battery life, 
video acceleration, security, audio processing, camera processing. So maybe, just maybe we can get rid of those potato 720p webcams. Arguably the biggest advantage here though is that Apple is now in full control. So I'm not gonna have to worry about poor thermals because Intel is behind on a roadmap or because a CPU launch is delayed. They make the chips for their computers that works with the software they design. So clearly this has worked out great for iPhone and iPad, but what took Apple so long to do this and why not turn an iPad into a touchscreen Mac? There's a lot that goes into that answer, but what it really comes down to is apps. 15 years ago at WWDC, Steve Jobs announced that Apple was transitioning from PowerPC Macs to Intel. We are gonna begin the transition from the PowerPC to Intel processors, and we are gonna begin it for you now and for our customers next year. Those processors were based off the x86 platform, which is the same as current Macs today. The iPhone and iPad are ARM-based devices, so essentially two different languages, two different platforms. And the idea of transitioning from x86 over to ARM is a theoretical nightmare, or at least it was until today. The good news is, is that every single native Mac app is ready to go and will be on launch. That even includes their pro apps like Logic Pro and Final Cut Pro 10. The chip Apple showed off today was what they're calling the A12Z Bionic, and while there wasn't any hard benchmarks or numbers, they showcased Final Cut Pro 10 running natively with three streams of 4K ProRes video. I'm like ready to trade in my MacBook. Like right now if I can edit 4K ProRes video on a machine with no fans. The even better news is that Apple is already working with developers to start the transition as well, starting with Microsoft, although it was kind of hilarious watching Craig show off Microsoft Word like it was a PS5 graphics demo. Let's take a look at Word. It runs great. Scrolling is super smooth. Everything you do is just super responsive. Our boy Craig also showed some love to Adobe with Lightroom, Photoshop, and said that the entire Creative Cloud Suite would also be ready to go, which is a huge chunk of apps. So this is ultimately done in Xcode and then delivered through Universal 2. And to simplify what that does, it essentially takes two binaries or two different languages on a single platform. That way, when a developer creates an app, it'll support both Intel-based Macs and ARM-based Macs at the same time. Now, if you're wondering what about the other apps that aren't rewritten or transitioned over to this new platform, that's where Rosetta makes its comeback, specifically Rosetta 2. The original Rosetta was used to run PowerPC-based apps on Intel-powered Macs. And Rosetta allows us to translate PowerPC to Intel. It lets us run existing PowerPC binaries on Intel. So existing apps run. It is a dynamic binary translator. It runs existing PowerPC apps. It is transparent to users. It's nothing like classic where you're loading a whole operating system. This is totally transparent. You just click on a PowerPC binary, it starts translating. Honestly, the more I look back at that 2005 keynote, it was eerily similar to what we saw today. And the way we look at it is performance per watt. For one watt of power, how much performance do you get? And when we look at the future roadmaps projected out mid-2006 and beyond, what we see is the power PC gives us sort of 15 units of performance per watt. But the Intel roadmap in the future gives us 70. Fast forward all these years, Rosetta 2 is used to run, you guessed it, Intel-based apps on Apple-powered Macs. This is Maya, the powerful animation and modeling software running great here on Apple Silicon. I already have a model open that consists of over 6 million polygons. And as you can see, I can fluidly move around in this scene. So let's make it a little more challenging and bring in textures and shaders as well. And still, everything is incredibly fluid. So Rosetta works great, and the performance is simply fantastic. So what's happening here is this is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which is a native x86 Mac app being translated through Rosetta 2. In theory, it's definitely the iffiest part of the entire process, but from what we've seen so far, it looks good. Another huge benefit with this transition is that iPad and iPhone apps will run natively on Mac as well. So better performance, better power efficiency, and everything working closer together. What's also cool is that it's going to translate the apps as you install them. So this is definitely, I would say, the iffiest part of the whole process, but they showcased it. It looks smooth and I, for one, am super excited to see how this pans out. Either way, exciting times and hopefully this video kind of cleared up some answers or maybe any confusion with this announcement because while there technically wasn't hardware at WWDC today, 
there also technically was. So thank you guys for watching. Appreciate you. Drop a like if you enjoyed it. This is Jonathan and I'll catch you guys later. When you record all day, the time shift of this video.